Good evening or good morning, good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're logging in from. I want to welcome everyone to our event this evening. My name is Michael Berry. I'm the director of the UCLA Center for Chinese Studies, and it's our great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's event. Um, before I begin introductions, I did want to acknowledge uh, a loss to our community recently. One of our great friends of the Center for Chinese Studies, Mr. Zhang Yongxiang, a renowned screenwriter from Taiwan, uh, who has written the screenplay for more than 160 films. He's recently visited UCLA for uh, events and interactions with our students. He recently passed. And I wanna, on behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies, express our profound condolences to him, to his family and friends and members of the community. Uh, for tonight's event, I want to start by expressing our thanks to Esther Zhou, the Assistant Director of the Center for Chinese Studies, Mrs. Yeo Zhu Jun, uh, the head of the Long Tai Foundation, Min Zhou of the Asia Pacific Center, all of our donors, and in particular, the Taiwan Academy and the Taiwan Ministry of Culture for making tonight's event uh, possible. It is our great honor to be hosting uh, the renowned Long Tai tonight. I think she may have lost her connection. Hopefully she'll be rejoining us momentarily. Um, I, while we're waiting for her to come back in, the Center for Chinese Studies uh, was established in 1986. So this is actually our 35th year uh, that we are celebrating uh, this year. And the center uh, has been active in promoting various facets of Chinese culture, literature, arts, the uh, scholarship, whether from anthropology to economics to history. And if you are interested in our events, please follow us on Facebook, on YouTube, sign up for our mailing list at the Center for Chinese Studies website. And tonight's event is actually a part of a series hosted by the Center for Chinese Studies, but facilitated by Taiwan Academy and the Ministry of Culture called the Taiwan Spotlight Series. This is the seventh lecture in a series of eight. And previously we had the great honor of hosting uh, such renowned figures as Bai Xianyong, uh, Cai Mingliang, and Wu Mingyi. And tonight we have the honor of having uh, the wonderful Professor Long Ying Tai with us. And so if you excuse me, I'm gonna pause for a moment because we seem to have lost Professor Long. And I just want to check if she's been able to rejoin our room. Okay, I think she's coming back. Okay, so Professor Long has rejoined us. Good to see you. And <laughs> And so I'm going to uh, take a moment to introduce our speaker, but before that, a little bit about the format of tonight's event. Tonight, it will be an English language forum. And so Professor Long and I will be in dialogue for a little more than an hour. And we're going to be talking about her life, her career, her works. Um, and then we're eventually going to open it up to you, the audience. And if you utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, you can post your questions there. Feel free to post in either Chinese or English. We will begin with a few English questions to kind of round out the English dialogue, but then the last section will have a Chinese forum where I will just speak, uh, switch to the Chinese language. So feel free to post questions in either Chinese or English, whatever you are more comfortable in. A little bit about our speaker. Uh, Professor Long Ying Tai is someone who really it's kind of cliche when you say a speaker needs no introduction, but indeed she is a household name to so many uh, who come from the Chinese cultural world. She was the first head of the cultural division of Taipei Sitter and City and later became the inaugural Minister of Culture of Taiwan from 2012 to 2014. But I think many of our viewers probably know her better as an author and a public intellectual. Uh, she has written well more than uh, two dozen books, when I first started studying Chinese in Taiwan in the early 90s, and my Chinese language level got to the ability where I could actually read a book from cover to cover, uh, Long Ying Tai's books were probably one of the first uh, sources that I went to. And one of the reasons was you couldn't walk into a bookstore in the early 90s in Taiwan without seeing a row of her books spread out as in, on the you know, in table when you walk into almost any bookstore. And what's really miraculously is today, 30 years later, 
you walk into any bookstore in Taiwan or Hong Kong, and they're still right there in the front of the bookstores on the bestseller list. And so to have that kind of staying power and to remain relevant and engaged over so many years is really quite a wondrous feat. And her, I think for many, her writing career began around 1985 with a book called Yehua or The Wildfire. And probably another landmark work is two decades later in 20, uh, 2009, Big River, Big Sea, which has become a kind of international bestseller in the global Chinese market. And those are, uh, you see the, the title of tonight's event from uh, the wildfire to the big sea. Those are two works that we're going to be talking about. But she's also the author of In Europe, A Letter to Taiwan, Bottoms Up, Thomas Mann, Reflections on a Century, Seeing You Off, Watching at the End of the Century. So many just incredible uh, books that have changed the lives of so many readers. She is also an academic. She is the Hongliang Haoling Distinguished Fellow in the Humanities at the University of Hong Kong and also Chair Professor at National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. She holds a PhD in uh, English and American Literature from Kansas State University. And I am so happy to have Professor Long with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Michael, thank you. And apologies for my short uh, disappearance just a while ago. I have moved to uh, to Taidong, which is at the um, at the Pacific, and so my internet has not been very stable. And so I'm back. Um, what a pleasure um, to have the chance to talk to you. And yes. um, I'm looking forward to uh, listening to the, the the questions from the audience, from the readers as well. Great. Thank you. So we're going to begin with our dialogue and we'll start with a few questions about kind of personal growth and formative years and your journey towards literature. And I was wondering if you could start by just telling us a little bit about the impact of literature on you during those early years. What were the books that had the greatest impact on you when you were growing up and later on during college? Uh, what kind of went into your formation? No, when I look at our time um, and spirit now, I'm kind of a, myself am amazed how I grew up. It looks like a different world and different parallel time. Um, I spent my teenage years in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, in order to tell you what literature had an impact on me, I think I have to give you an impression of the time and zeitgeist of the 60s, late 60s of Taiwan. Um, it was a time when, for example, dating was not allowed and student dancing parties had to be held in secrecy. So that, that was the time. I, in a, I remember I went to a freshman party on college and um, then a police raid interrupted the party. So everybody had to flee. And one of the students that I knew, he jumped out of the window on the third floor and broke his leg. So that was dancing party uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and till to today, I still remember the moment when the police raided the party, the music that we were dancing to. I don't know, Michael, maybe, maybe you were, uh, you were too young for this. I remember that was a theme song of uh, the movie Love Story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's too early for you. But anyway, and then in 1972, when I was a third year in college, um, some of my student, uh, fellow students were arrested and sent to jail for reading Karl Marx. And I was 20 to 25 years sentenced. So that was very serious thing. So that was the time and age that I grew up in. Um, a lot of works by Chinese authors from the 30s, uh, 1930s and 40s were simply off the shelf. And that is why later on, many years later, when I was asked a long time, is your writing affected by um, Lu Xun, for instance? Uh, I could only laugh because when I was young, I never read Lu Xun. Uh, it was illegal to read him. And since I grew up in the, in the South, I also had no access to those literature. So as a young person growing up in the so-called, at that time, the third world Taiwan, encapsulated in the anti-communist bloc, my reading list looked like a smorgasbord with no motif. 
um, it was dominated by European literature and mostly 19th century. So when I was a teenager, I was reading Zola, Victor Hugo, uh, Dumas, Father and Son, Balzac, and um, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Um, and in high school, in, it was fashionable for pretentious girls to carry hardcover books under the arm and walk around campus. And what were those books? We had Nietzsche, we had Kafka, and we had Jean-Paul uh, Sartre, of course. So this is that type of work. And so what left an imprint on me were books by, um, um, by Kafka, for example. So that sense of detachment, loneliness, a very deep sense of alienation somehow spoke to me. Um, and then I remember when I was reading the, the American Transcendentals, again, 19th century, you know, Emerson and especially Thoreau. Mm -hmm. And I, in the Chinese classics, I was very much attracted to uh, Zhuangzi's writing. So somehow Zhuangzi and the Transcendentalist and, 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 and Thoreau, they came to pick together and spoke to me. Um, that really, I think that left an imprint. And it, I think there are traces of them still show up in my writing today. I'm curious, just a follow up. This was also the era where you have the nativist movement, Xiang Tu Wen Shui, and the mm -hmm. modernist movement, and writers like Chen Ningzhen and Bai Xianyong and Wang Wenxing. Were, were mm -hmm. they in, in your radar, and were you reading them as well? As a, uh, not so much, yes, but to me, not so much. And you know, there's a difference between me and many of my friends who were studying and growing up in the metropolis of Taipei. I was living in a fishing village in the South, going to a university in the South. Uh, Chenggong University at that time was kind of, a, kind of a different world from whatever is happening in Taipei. So my, my friends, they would have the chance to go to Wu Changjie and bought those illegal publications uh, from underneath the, those stores, magazine stores, or they were in touch with Bai Xianyong's clique and reading modern literature. And in the South, that was, it's a different world. We were riding our bicycles uh, on campus and uh, I was not so connected with the mainstream that was taking place in Taipei. Uh, and there probably as an outlet, I was kind of connected with something farther away. That's 19th century French and Russian literature. And very oddly, we were reading uh, Bertrand Russell and his teacher, Whitehead. I don't understand why. Imagine a 17-year-old girl living in the fish, fishing village in South, Southern <laughs> Taiwan, going to school and reading process philosophy from Whitehead. I don't think I understood a word of it. So it's a, in a controlled society. That was not a free society at that time. I guess the energy of the youth, they just go wherever they find fresh air. Yeah. So, and, and therefore, I think that my experience of growing up in Taiwan is quite different from the, my elite circle of friends who grew up in Taipei. Yeah. And, and how do you think that impacted your later trajectory as a writer? The fact that you weren't at Beinu or all these other kind of elite high schools and that you had, you know, had this rural experience. Um, how do you how do you see that impacting your later trajectory? Um, I actually I realized later, you know, at the beginning I didn't know what this bigger world in Taipei was, but later on I realized I really grew up with the sons and daughters of fishermen, of uh, farmers, street vendors. Uh, wet market uh, store owners uh, and the children of those uh, displaced old soldiers from the Civil War. And I really, all my writing career, I realized that I have been writing for them. You know, just imagine in 1984-85 when I was, I began to write The Wildfire with fear in my heart, but with a purpose, you know, 
to change the society. I told myself, I want whatever I write, the taxi drivers will be willing to read and understand. The, 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 uh, the, the women who are selling vegetables in my market, she will be able to, to understand. So that was the beginning point. And then come 35 years later, when the news, the novel uh, appeared, Da Wu Shan Xia, you see all the characters in there are really country folks, farmers, fishermen, and the, the, the Taoist from, from the temple. So these are the people I grew up with. And I write for them. Um, well, it's my honor to write for them. Thank you. You know, another really interesting part of your background, besides growing up in Southern Taiwan as a uh, kind of second generation Wai Shangren, which was less typical as opposed to so many who grew up in Taipei, is that later you had this really rich international experience living eight years in the United States, uh, 13 years in Switzerland and Germany. And maybe you could also talk a bit about how that experience in Europe and the US impacted your worldview as a young adult and inform your early writing. And, and as you transitioned away from Sartre and existentialism, what were you reading as you came to America and Germany and how did your literary tastes and appreciation of literature change? You know, even nowadays when I, I'm still in the countryside, I live in the Amis, uh, Amezu village today. Uh, and when I come, come across young persons who are kind of wondering where they are going um, I would encourage them, don't have fear. Look at me coming from the fishing village and I went very, very far. Um, so before I went to Europe in 1986, I was a typical Taiwan educated person whose worldview was basically shaped by American perspective. Um, by the time I moved to Switzerland, um, and then Germany, I had already lived in the US for eight, nine years. And therefore, when I went to Europe, I really carried with me in my bag um, with an American lens. I saw Europe, America, same basket, same thing, it's the West. So I got my biggest intellectual shock when I arrived in Europe. Um, the, very quickly, I realized that the U.S. perspective is not at all a standard to uh, understand Europe. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes I play a game with myself. Um, I would watch a movie and I put it on silent so that I don't hear. From the body language, the, the way the person walks down the street, I know this is not an American film. It's a European film because the, the body language is different. The, the human relations is different. The way the eye contacts are different between the Europeans and the Americans. So that, that was quite an eye opening experience for me. But and then gradually, I also came to realize Switzerland and Germany, I was in Zurich. So in German speaking part of Switzerland, very quickly, I realized not only that you, sh you cannot use the American standard to measure Europe, you cannot use German speaking area to understand the Latin areas like France and Spain. The difference is huge. And, and gradually I also came to realize, oh, Anglo-Saxon is not really Europe. So the UK is not Europe. And, and, and therefore I kind of, uh, when Brexit took place, I kind of understand this, the, the mindset, you know, the difference is, is big. So, um, and you ask, so what did I read later? I began, when I arrived in Europe, I began to read intellectual history of Europe because I wanted to find out one thing, liberalism, where does it come from? And with what route it travels? When I was in Switzerland, I was struck by this conservative element in the society, in the social fabric. And I came from the US with all the ideas, idealization about liberalism. And I landed in this German speaking part of Europe and I found, so what is this? Where is liberalism? And then I tried to trace how 
it started maybe industrial revolution in the UK, how it traveled to France, how it traveled to the German states and so on and so forth. So that was an eye opening. Um, so then I realized there isn't a thing called the West. There are many Wests. And if you ask me, you know, so the, my European experience, what kind of impact it has, uh, has on me. I would say uh, because of my European experiences and because Europe itself is so diverse, I learned differentiation and allowing pluralism is something that is really, really very important. And that's what I think it's an important lesson for me. Thank you. So I want to kind of segue a little away from personal, you know, experience and to your some of your major works. And the first book I really want to talk about is uh, Yehua, The Wildfire. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my first introduction to you. Um, not only your bravery and kind of standing up and speaking truth to power, but even linguistically, I mentioned I was studying Chinese. The first time I encountered Taiwanese in script form, I remember one of your essays in The Wildfire uses the word wo yang. Uh, which is, you know, Taiwanese, but you use Chinese characters. And I remember looking at mm -hmm. all, in all the dictionaries trying to find this. And it was only later I realized that it was actually uh, Taiwanese that you were rendering. Uh -huh. It's also kind of uh, groundbreaking in its own way during that time. I told you realize in wildlife, I, it was the language I use. I try to make my dear vegetable cello understand what I write. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And for so many readers, I think, in Taiwan, that was the book that brought you to uh, public attention. Um, those essays had such a profound impact on public discourse, the formation of a new type of civil society in Taiwan during the mid to late 80s. And they unleashed this unprecedented debate, controversy, and ushered in this kind of new level of civil engagement. Um, of course, timing was a big factor because those essays were right on the eve of martial law being lifted. And it was almost the perfect book for the perfect moment. And I was wondering if you could take us back to that era in the mid to late eighties, how did it, th those essays included in the wildfire started out as serialized essays in the China Times? And if you could tell us a little bit about how that column began, uh, how did you navigate the controversy that erupted? Because it was a, extremely controversial, some of the, those essays. And how did that shape your view moving forward, being involved in the eye of the hurricane, so to speak, around this book? Um, it started as something that comes from not an, it, well, a reverse version of the innocent abroad, meaning that this innocent has been abroad in the United States for eight or nine years as a, as a student with, without any real social experiences. And then she comes back to her hometown, uh, her, her, her own country, uh, and then is shocked by what she sees. So it's kind of a reversed version of the innocent abroad. And then she did not know that uh, there were many people who criticized the, uh, the state and got jailed, but got persecuted or became, or they had uh, written too much, has said too much that they became cynical and they stopped writing. She didn't know any of that. She came back, uh, a very fresh spirit person, and she saw things around her, uh, unjust things. Uh, impossible things. And she wonder, why isn't anybody protesting against it? The injustice is so obvious. So out of that innocent uh, uh, out moral outrage came the wildfire. Um, uh, but, but I was not that naive either. After the third article in the newspaper, I was kind of avalanched by readers' responses. Then I knew things are not as what I thought it is. It's much more than that. So it's about, it's altogether, that book has altogether about 28 articles. So it, the first one is total innocent, innocent moral outrage, calling for action. Um, but starting from the third one, I, 
knew what I was doing. I knew what I was in. Okay. And there's one thing I want to touch is you, you, you mentioned the word timing. Yes, when we look from hindsight, oh, the timing was right for, for this book. But you know, that was, that really is the wisdom of the hindsight. Because when you are in the middle of the tunnel, you don't see any light and you don't know if there is light, if there's an exit. Just like it's similar to uh, what happened with the before the Berlin War, when it felt I was there, um, people did not expect it to happen that way. Um, people didn't know it's going to end that way. People didn't know that the, 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 the end of the tunnel is so near. So it's only from hindsight, it's always oh, very close. But when you were in the tunnel, you didn't know. So I wrote the whole uh, collection of uh, wildfire in total fear. Um, when, when I was writing, my father used to call me every day just to make sure I did not disappear. Because from his experience, you know, out of the telephone, he would say to me, daughter, you have to know what happens to people when people speak up. I have seen people in the middle of the night with a, with a sack over their head and they were thrown into the ocean. And I don't want to, this, I don't want to see this happen to my daughter. So it, it's real fear. So only afterwards we say, oh, it's very close to the, to the light at the end of the tunnel. But when you were in there, that was not the case. And I remember speaking of fear while writing it, uh, I, I was very, very low keyed. I hardly uh, went public. So most people and the readers, when the book was published, they thought this is because my name is very masculine. So people saw the writer is, is a man. For, 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 for a long time, I thought the writer is a man. But I remember the night before uh, the book was going to the printer, um, the publisher came to, came to me <coughs> and he was pacing in my apartment. He, his concern is one article in the collection of the 28 articles. Um, he asked me, if, if I would consider taking out that particular article, which is entitled the George Orwell's Taiwan. And his reasoning is, um, if this article is in, the chances that the book will be confiscated in the morning in the printer is a hundred times higher. So we have to make a decision that night. And, and so I, I thought about it and the conclusion was, I said, let's give it a try. So that article was in there. So that was the atmosphere at that time. Um, and so the book came out and, and the, when the book was in the market, I was given birth to my first child. I was in a hospital uh, and uh, feeding the baby <clears throat> and my friends trying to shield me from the storm outside. So I didn't know anything for months. Only a month later, I realized that the whole um, uh, party propaganda kind of an avalanche on me during that whole period of time. So that was my first encounter with political storm caused by writing. And of course, many more would follow later in the, later, in the following 35 years. Um, under different circumstances. Um, but all the storms, throughout the, all the storms, some, uh, a lot, half of them are from China, half of them in Taiwan, but the essence remains the same. That is, you get reprisals when you write against the one with power. Um, the one with power is not always the state or the party. Oftentimes, especially nowadays, it's the public opinion. It's the masses which has this dominating uh, dictate, dictatorial power over the society. So that's the, how to go through storms. Start, uh, I learned starting with the wildfire. Mm. And although 
I mean, we don't have those kind of political campaigns against a book or a writer in Taiwan these days, like you, the controversy then. But in some ways, those lessons, I think, are very relevant to what's happening in mainland China today. And I'm wondering, how was those essays, were those essays made available in China during the 80s? And um, how do mainland readers relate to the social political issues that you addressed first in the wildfire and later moving forward? And yes, I, I, um, you know, a book has its own independent life once it's released. Um, the wildfire was published in Taiwan in late, between December 85 and, and, and January 86. Uh, unauthorized copies appear immediately in China. And in 1988, I gave uh, an authorized, I made an authorized copy in, in China. And I was told excerpts of the books was being read out uh, on the Tiananmen Square in 1989. So I knew at that time that the students uh, widely read the book. And interestingly, the book Wildfire was considered in China uh, prognostic. Uh, prognostic meaning that all the social problems depicted in the book, uh, typical of Taiwan of the 1980s, became prevalent and very obvious in China a decade later. So the, the readers of wild, Wildfire in China, they thought I was addressing China, which is not, which is not, but, 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 and, and therefore the reception of, uh, of Wildfire was an ongoing one. And therefore, not in Taiwan, but in China, you have the 10th anniversary edition of the wild, Wildfire, the 20th uh, anniversary edition, the 30th anniversary edition. So um, um, uh, the issues in there, for example, uh, the fake formula milk for babies or the fake alcohols which, make, which kill people, uh, the uh, polluted rivers, um, the censorship and or the injustice caused by the monopoly of state power. It's, it's, it's typical of the Chinese society in the 90s and, and until now. Yeah, it's interesting how so many, so many of the things that Taiwan went through in the 70s and 80s, a decade later, China went through some right. of the same. Right. So the culture, I think that it, it probably proves that the cultural roots go very, very deep. Yeah. I want to transition a little bit because at some point after Wildfire, you there's also a transition in your writing from more politically engaged work to much more personal work. Um, and I'm thinking of books like uh, children, take your time, dear Andreas, and Mu Song, watching you go. Those are just a few of the examples of this more personal uh, style of writing. And I was wondering if you talk about the transition and what were the factors that led you to reveal, to dig deep into your own kind of psychology and family history and expose some of the most private, vulnerable, and personal stories. And did you have concerns as a writer to kind of put yourself out there in that sense and make all of that, those aspects of your private life available to all your readers? Well, Michael, I, I actually don't consider them private. You know why? <clears throat> um, these books appear to be personal, but actually it's personal only in, in terms of style and the language, um, the essence of these books, I think is as public as writing can go. I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the letters was exchanges with Andreas, for example. Um, ostensibly, it is a letter exchange between mother and son, which is private. However, if you look into the content of each letter, what are the, the mother and son discussing? They are discussing um, how patriotism is expressed in a football match, uh, how nationalism is revealed differently in the UK and a country like Germany and in the US. And they talk about 
uh, for example, um, Bertolt Brecht's play, uh, The Life of uh, uh, Galileo, um, is Brecht trying to say that you should stand up against authority no matter what, or you actually should be smarter, you negotiate or you hide yourself so that your deeper aim, higher aim, uh, telling the truth about the universe, get the chance to be told to the world. Um, and so you can, you can see that, okay, these uh, letters, letter exchange between mother and son. However, when I was writing it, I meant it to be a textbook for high school teachers and parents to discuss these issues with their children at the dinner table or in the classroom about what is civil courage? What is obedience and rebellion? Um, so actually to me, I only use that form in order to, to attract the readers, especially young readers, that you are willing to enter these philosophical and ethical debates. Um, so Andrea, uh, Letters with Andrea is a typical example. I'm also trying to hint to parents and, young, and, and their young adults that across generation, it is possible to carry out serious discussions on seemingly very serious topics. And these topics need to be discussed. So it is private, yes. However, it is also very, very public-minded. Uh, and, and that applies to all of these books. And then Tian Chang Di Jiu, for example. It is probably the most private of all. It's about my mother who is aging, who suffers from Alzheimer. It is private. However, I wrote it because I see so many mid-aged uh, children uh, at a loss and suffering great pain, uh, not knowing how to deal with their 90 or 80 year old mother or father who has Alzheimer, who's aging, who's sick. So it is really a public issue, a serious public issue. I just wanted to share the, 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 the pain and with these people who are suffering. So I don't know if you say it is privately personal and yet it, it is public issue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, since we're on the topic of this crossroads between private and public, and you mentioned your mother, uh, she actually plays a critical role in one of your most beloved books, A Big River, Big Sea, 1949. Yes. Uh, she, mm -hmm. uh, she, her, her story is a kind of a central story among all the different stories you thread in. And for those who aren't familiar with this book, it really takes its heart as the Great Divide of 1949, right? And, and explores, it's a deep dive into the personal trauma, the personal stories uh, that were so central to kind of the nation being torn apart uh, politically, culturally, uh, and otherwise. And it's become a book that's gone through, I don't know how many editions and been really uh, had an incredible impact, even kind of jump-started a whole new academic subfield of scholars and writers who started to re-examine 1949 as a serious area of academic interest. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the origin and evolution of Big River, Big Sea, and what were the biggest challenges for you writing that book? Um, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall was trampled down, I was there. And my then husband is a German. His family, he comes from a divided family. So part of his family were from West Germany and part of them from East Germany. So he comes from a divided family, divided by the war. And I come from a family divided by the war. This, about the same time, 1949, and the, the Berlin Wall fell in uh, 1989. So that was the time when I look at the, uh, the crumbling of, of the wall, I was saying to myself, it's time I write about our 1949. So that was the first time the thought came to me. Um, 
but then I was raising children like you are now, and then you are carried away by uh, many uh, realities of life. But in, nine, in 2004, my father died. That was an awakening call because I realized that whole, the whole generation of 1949, they are leaving or they have left. So it's kind of a five minutes before 12, the door of history is going to close down forever. I knew that I couldn't wait anymore. So um, I really, mm, so I decided to really work on it and active, most actively in 2007, 2008. Um, I framed uh, Da Jiang Da Hai as a, again, as a personal story, as a mother trying to tell her son about the civil war, because the son has just received a draft notice from the army. So uh, I, put it, I put this whole spectrum of such a panoramic history into a very personal, um, frame, um, and and I think it's this is pregnant with uh, with the metaphors because this is a, a nineteen year old young man who is going to the army. What does that mean? I mean, any nineteen year old with a draft notice in your hand, reading it, you have to think about what you're doing and who is asking you to do this. And, and when this and that was about also about the time when the Germany was involved in a, in the Gulf War, you know, uh, in two was it in 2000, 2003, uh, the first Gulf War, when uh, I was living in um, in in the suburb of Frankfurt, and I was I was um, breastfeeding my second baby in the middle of the night, say three o'clock or two o'clock. I heard this uh, a huge, um, immense humming sound coming gradually, coming closer and closer in the darkness of the night, and then over my house, over. And only in the morning I realized that was the taking off of the hundreds of bombers from the Wiesbaden battlefield, from the Wiesbaden camp, American army camp, to bomb Iraq. Um, and so when this baby becomes a 19 year old young man with an army uh, draft note in his hand, with this book, I was saying young man, every young man, you should really think about what you are and where you are and whether, you, whether this is what you choose to do. Um, and, and so it, it is a big history, but it is also personal. It's very, I wanted to be personal. I also felt uh, my focus is people, the suffering of people, no matter be the invader or uh, the doer or the victims. Um, um, and I was totally uninterested in writing a dry history book, a correct textbook. I, I wanted to write a literature uh, where everything is true. And so the biggest challenge is, it's to me, it's like fiction. It's, it's a personal narrative. However, I want to do the documentation, all the documentation. And that was quite a big challenge because I traveled hundreds and thousands of miles to, to interview people. I went to former Manchuria, Dongbei, uh, to get people out to talk to me. Um, so that was, you speak of challenge, that was one of the first challenges. And um, there were many people who didn't want to talk. Interestingly, there were the, the old soldiers of Taiwan who didn't want to talk because they were heartbroken. And then there were people who experienced starvation, all kinds of abuses in China. They didn't want to talk because they still had fear. So, so just to interview these people, that was a tremendous, took a tremendous of, uh, of work. And then another, another challenge was there were, uh, during the course of, of the writing and researching, there were 
so often the bursts of emotions. You know, when I interview old men, they were in their teens when they were somehow got in, became a soldier from whichever side. And whenever these old men mention the moment when they left their mother, these old men broke into tears like a baby, you know, 90 year old man broke into tears like a baby. And then I remember uh, one older person in Dongbei, uh, in, um, he remember during the siege of Changchun, Changchun Weicheng, for half a year, people simply died from starvation. He remember how his two month old baby died, was crawling on the road with intestines coming out of the little body. You know, and these are these these um so the challenge for me is how do I kind of uh, embrace these deep pain and emotions while uh stay detached because you have to write. And for the art of writing, you need a lot of detachment. So to balance these two was a big challenge while writing Da Jiang Da. And you, and you just mentioned the very different response that old soldiers had in Taiwan versus the mainland. But another difference of response is how the book was received. Of course, the war itself, right? There's all different perspectives on 1949 politically in Taiwan and the mainland. And Big River, Big Sea, in some ways, offers an alternative or a, a loser's perspective of the Civil War. And it differs from official narratives in the PRC. Um, and I'm wondering how that translated into its reception in, in China, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, these different Chinese speaking communities, I imagine you had very different reaction from readers. The strangest thing about the reception is the book, uh, Da Jiang Da Hai, because it is the book which is most strictly banned in China. My friend tested out. So he put, he went uh, to China with a backpack of different books, my other books with Da Jiang Da Hai. So when you went through the custom, the custom officials have been so well trained that he took out all the books, look at them and picked out Da Jiang Da Hai out and confiscated this particular book, but not the others. So um, it's very, uh, the operation was very precise. Um, but despite the fact that it is strictly forbidden, but it's magic for me because I think this book is the widest read of my, all my books in China. Everybody has read it, and um, probably through uh, parroted copies uh, or mostly uh, online, um, poorly, poorly put together uh, PDF copies of some sort. So everybody has read it. Um, what I know, I know probably very little about the responses to, to, to the book. Uh, what I know is that um, there are movements uh, in China to write your own history. So people urge the young people to go and interview your grandmother and your grandfather and write it down. So in other words, the private personal histories uh, to steering away from the state monopoly of history, go to your parents, go to your grandparents and you find out more. So that started moving, which was really very uh, touching. And then another example is, you know, I mentioned the Changchun Weicheng. Um, it started, when I read in the news that there was a department store building was going to be built in the center of town. And then when they broke the ground, dug deep, and it appeared hundreds and hundreds of bones. Uh, and then this, this, and this discovery repeats itself. In, in the city almost, um, whenever you dig deep, you come up with bones. And that's what leads me to, to, to do research on this. When I, and I, I flew there, I went to Changchun and I talked to old people. I discovered uh, 
the older generation who went through it didn't want to talk about it. And the younger generation, the middle-aged generation, she said they have never heard of it. Nothing of that has happened. So there was one occasion when a, a, a driver, my driver actually, he said, no, couldn't be. I grew up here, I was born here. Generation of my family were born here. It didn't happen. I said, why don't you call your grandfather? He's still living, you said. In front of me, make the call and ask him if that siege occurred. So really we sat down and he made the call in front of me. And on the other side of the line was his uh, grandfather. On the spot, the grandfather over the telephone line told him everything, what happened. And, and this driver was sitting in front of me with, with the telephone in his hand of a total shock. So um, well, I, I'm happy that this book was read in China by the Chinese, um, despite the fact that I don't get one cent of royalty, but it's perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry we're moving so quickly. That we're, this is kind of a Zoma Kanhua dialogue where we're riding on the horse, looking at the flowers, just looking at uh, <laughs> trying to revisit various uh, landmark moments in your career and your writing. But one of the more recent landmarks, I think it's behind me, is this book, uh, She Walks the Dawu Mountains. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, most recent book. One thing that sets it apart from your earlier works is it's your first full length novel. Uh, and you spent three years living in a small town at the foot of the Dawu Mountains, exploring the natural environment, interacting with local farmers, as well as the native population. And I think everybody probably expected you would write another nonfiction book like Da Jiang Da Hai or every, you know, what you've become known for. You have written some fiction. I remember writing your love story, uh, Diao, uh, Da Hai Do Bao, Diao right? Uh, yeah. Falling in love in Heidelberg. Falling in love in Heidelberg. Yeah. Yes, many, many years ago. I bought that when I was a student. Uh, mm -hmm. But mostly you've been known for your uh, nonfiction. But instead you wrote this really kind of magical and mystical and uh, wondrous novel. And I'm wondering, how did you make that literary decision to fictionalize your experience and maybe talk a little bit about the origins of this uh, recent novel? Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, I thought of nonfiction writing and I tried many versions of it and then I gave it up because finally I decided that my protagonist for Dao Shanxia is going to be a ghost. Um, and, 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 and just Nonfiction became too confining for me. How do I have a murder case and a wandering ghost in a nonfiction? I just couldn't do it. So it naturally had to become, become a fiction. It gave me all the freedom. Yeah, so that was fun. It's kind of crisscrossing between different spaces and, and time zone. So um, only, only fiction gives me the, uh, the freedom to do that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really such a multifaceted work. You, it's, it has elements of nature writing. It's kind of a index of or a compendium of 162 plants. I think it's 115 animals that you catalog. It's a crime novel. You mentioned the murder uh, and the kind of unjust conviction of an innocent man. You could also look at it as almost a children's philosophy uh, kind of dealing with the themes of time, death, and love, um, somewhat reminiscent of Sophie's world. And I'm wondering, did you intend this for young adult readers? Um, what kind of market, I don't know if you were thinking of markets, but, uh, and when, what kind of research did you do? Like you said, you spent three years writing this, but what was your homework like? <laughs> A lot of homework, but you know, the homework for Da Wu Shanxia was really, really fun. Uh, I, as opposed to the homework for Da Jiang Da Hai, which was, <laughs> which was so, 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 um, <clears throat> so painful. So uh, I am a plants fanatic, um, me, and I do nature journaling as well. So quite a bit of research is required to get the flora and, and, and the fauna correct. So um, Michael, if you come to Taiwan someday after the pandemic, you must climb this mountain, the Dao mountain. The peak is 3,092 meters high, the fifth highest in Taiwan. I did the climbing 
in order to, to get a feel for, for the, the novel. Now, every eco detail in the book is authentic. For instance, there's one place which mentioned in the book where the ghost, the 14-year-old ghost, and, uh, and a, a Formosan flying fox. Uh, flying fox is in Chinese, hu fu, hu li de hu, bian fu de fu, shi zhong bian fu. So the flying fox and the ghost met on the branches of a Formosan hemlock tree. Uh, and, and the book says at the height of 2,069 meters. So if you go climb the mountain up to 2,069 meters spot, you do see a hemlock. So that's the homework uh, that I had to, I had to do. Um, and, and then uh, with young adults, I have always wanted to write a book for young adults. And you know why? I raised children in, mostly in Germany. When the children were young, uh, every week I would bring them to the local library. And we, as they grew up, we would walk through the aisles. Oh, these two aisles are for eight years old. And then moving on to these aisles, nine years old, and to 10 years old, 11, 12 years old. These are all books for young, for young children, and then move into 13 and 14 teenagers or young adults. Um, I realized that it's so important for children to grow up with literature. In other words, uh, we should let the children grow up with literature, but then there must be good writers writing for them as well. So it has always been on my mind, on my, my list to do. I have to write for young adults and for children. So when I was writing, preparing to start with Shanxia, I was also doing literary decision. Right? There are many possible directions, you know. And so finally I decided, no, I want this ghost girl, this very sweet ghost girl, 14 year old. Um, I want this book to be read by teenagers. I want the high school teachers discussing the book with their young students. But how do I, you know, my homework again, I have to get the language of the teenage. How do they talk to each other nowadays? You know? So what I did, I, um, I told the, my, my town uh, high school, middle high, and said, I would offer a writing course for 14 year olds which I did. And I spent three days with them. Uh, and I also went out with them, talking to them, discussing those literary, uh, those philosophical questions together with 14 year old, what is time? You know, what is life? What is death? If a tree falls down in the deepest of the mountains, uh, you don't hear the sound falling. How do you know it has fallen? These kind of questions we discuss in class. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, children's philosophy is taught in schools in Europe and in Germany, but in the Taiwanese cur curriculum, some, that does not exist. So when I wrote this, I wanted this to be a novel, a philosophical novel read by teenagers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I. I'm a kind of a Wenichi and a literary youth at heart, so I'd love to just keep talking about literature, but I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk at least a little bit about your political life. And so I want to end my section of the questions with that before we open it up to the audience. But a very important part of your career is you served as Taiwan's first Minister of Culture from 2012 to 2014. And it was a kind of a curious shift because you began your career as an iconoclast, someone from the margins who was screaming out at the government for accountability, um, calling the government out for various missteps. And now you all of a sudden found yourself in the heart of political power. And I'm wondering what were the greatest challenges at that time to make that transition? And what did you struggle with? And what kind of a journey that was for you going from the margins to the kind of the center? You know, serving as, as Minister of Culture in, in 2012 was already the second time. 
uh, it went into the public service. The first time occurred in 1999, when I was called back from, from Germany to Taiwan to serve as uh, culture minister for the city level. Um, but for both times, the basic spirit was this. If you can't beat them, you join them. In other words, um, you, you, um, I was figuring to myself that instead of complaining and criticizing that somebody has not done a good job, you might as well do it yourself. So that was in the back of my mind. And, and you notice, I, I don't know if you notice, Michael, that both times, those, those are my terms as civil servant, I was the so-called first um, minister, which to me does not at all indicate any pride or glory. What it indicates is it's a job to lay foundations. If it's not, if, if it had not been the job to lay foundations, I don't think I would go in. It makes it's meaningful to me only because it is job to do the planning to lay down the foundation. And how it's built it later, it's the second term, second minister, third minister, and so on. So I was only interested in doing laying the foundation work. Um, in 2012, when I left Hong Kong and joined the cabinet, my task was to build a minister, ministry of culture. There was no ministry of culture before. To build the Ministry of Culture on the national level, um, I had to bring four ministries together, wedge it together and become a Ministry of Culture. So imagine, you understand the, uh, the, the, the past uh, Taiwan history. So imagine how do you turn around a Ministry for Propaganda in an old authoritarian era? You turn it around into a ministry serving the cultural sectors in a democratic time. That's a lot of subversive work, so to speak. You change the mindset completely of the uh, of the civil service. So, um, so to me, uh, it's not a huge transition as people think. To me, it's either writing critically or making policies critically. Different angle, different position, doing the same thing. Um, so, and, and I, whether I'm writing wildfire or I'm making a, a cultural policy to, uh, for, for the country, um, the aim is the same, that I want to build Taiwan to be a better place to live. It's more open, more liberal-minded, more just, more civilized. It's all the same. For me, it's not, not a big transition. Thank you. So I'm going to ask one final question before we open it up. So to our audience, if you have questions burning inside, please <laughs> type them in the Q&A box. Um, but I'm going to ask about... You know, it's been nearly a decade since you stepped down as Minister of Culture, but it feels like in many ways we're living in an even more polarized political environment today than a decade ago. And whether that's in the United States between Democrats and Republicans, or we see what's happening in Hong Kong and mainland China and Taiwan even, um, there's so much divisiveness. And we're also witnessing kind of a new besides the political extremism, a new kind of historical trauma from COVID-19, maybe just as horrific as what, what happened in 1949 uh, in terms of the public health crisis and the way that it's divided so many people. And so in this moment, what's the role of writing, of literature, of culture? What role can it play in a moment like this? Do we need more wildfires to be set and more voices like that? And if you were, I, I'm just curious if you, from somebody who's been so vocal during times of transition and un instability, I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit for, especially for young writers, aspiring writers, wh wh what's their path forward today amid such extremism and instability? Michael, it's such an important question you just delivered. Um, 
I recall an article by Milan Kundera uh, in his book, which is collected in his book uh, called The Encounter. There's one essay in, in which he talks about friendship and a friendship in a polarized, divided world, torn by different beliefs and convictions, you know, like in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, if, in, in the US, if you have a different set of beliefs and convictions, you can't even sit together anymore. And uh, Kundera talked about uh, that time because in com under communist rule of, of Czech Republic, um, in Prague, you are absolutely divided by this. So, and he was saying friendship actually transcends uh, those transient ideologies and divisions. And that article struck me very much because today it's even more divided than before. Um, Politics and ideologies tend to have a gripping power on our psyche, making us forget that politics and ideologies actually are only transient and there are more permanent values actually uh, and deeper values in our lives. So there is a thing called fear and fear fuels the, our polit political passions and and fanaticism and politicians. I discovered politicians really use this fear as a magic wand. So if you ask me, so um, uh, would writers be still, would still be important for the future? It, does literature have a place in such a seemingly chaotic world where the, all the values seem to be upside down. What I would say is I believe literature can be very quiet, but it is a quiet power working against the manipulation of emotion and the manipulation of, um, of the mind. And so the, we have to, have literature um, use it against the blurring of the mind. I find that very, very uh, threatening, this blurring of the mind. So the, 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 the murkier the world looks, I mean, the more literature is needed. It is, it is something that clarifies the mind. And the young writers, you have, you just simply, you have no choice. You simply have to go forward and make the world better. What choice do we have? Yeah. You know, I'm, I do think, though, let, let's think about those right, young writers in mainland China today, where you talked about feeling threatened, you, you might disappear when you were writing Wildfire. Yeah. Your father was fearful for you. What advice would you have for a young writer in mainland China today uh, who wants to speak out about an issue? Oh, I want to say, when you, are in, when you are in the tunnel, it's dark, it's depressing, and you feel absolutely isolated and lonely. And we should remind yourself, I always remember, I always remember what uh, Hannah Arendt once said. Uh, she said, to keep the totalitarian power, it's very essential for the dictator to make you feel isolated and lonely because that is the way they have power over you. So for people in the tunnel, being in Hong Kong, in China, I hope you know that yes, you are in the dark tunnel, but you have to know this dark tunnel doesn't come just naturally. It's that manipulative power who try to make you feel lonely, but you have to be aware there are many other people of the same spirit, of the same mind, of the same aspirations, dreaming the same dream, who are there, or just you don't see them. They are there, hundreds of them, thousands of them, millions of them. And, um, there hasn't been a tunnel in this human world that does not have an exit. All tunnels have an exit. 
I, I can only say, do keep that flame in your heart. Don't let it die down. Thank you. So we're gonna transition to some of our audience questions. And let's start with Cecilia, who says how much she loves Dao Shan, and how much of the story is fiction and how much is based on actual events and people. <laughs> Cecilia, uh, um, if you believe in ghosts, then the ghost is real. Uh, I, I, I don't believe there's a ghost, so the ghost is definitely fiction. But uh, other than that, um, you know, fiction is sometimes uh, immature than the reality. And so, for example, if you're, you're asking really reality, real meaning, for example, the character, the Yuan Wai, the Yuan Wai, this funny, uh, love, lovely, um, funny character, he's the combination of three different men that I know from the town. And so he is both real and unreal. This is a question from Sufan mm -hmm. about translation. Why haven't more of your works been translated into English? And I'm just going to add a footnote here because what we, we, there's this cultural disparity. I mean, you, I mean, Professor Long's works are just as beloved in the Chinese speaking world as you know J.K. Rowling. I mean, she's a household name, and yet her works are not available in the West. And it would be unthinkable to imagine a you know, China or Taiwan without J.K. Rowling or Stephen King. And so there's this incredible disparity in terms of translation. But Sue's wondering, she's looking for translations of your work and just wants to know if you have recommendations for people who don't speak Chinese to access your work. Um, I don't think I've been very lucky with translation. Uh, funnily enough, uh, most of my works are translated into Japanese and Korean. And there are even translations in Polish, in now in Ukraine language, and so on. But um, most widespread languages are English. Then I don't have anything in English. Um, Michael knows very well um, the problem. For example, I think the one that's um, that should really be translated is Da Jiang Da Hai. However, translating Da Jiang Jiang Hai, I think it's a it's real challenging work because it's not written for the Western audiences and therefore it's not written according to chronological uh, sequence. It's so literary that the translation probably needs to be kind of rewrite so that um, Western readers who do not have a stock knowledge of uh, contemporary Chinese history would be able to understand it. So I have not been very lucky with translation, I hope. And, and I'm not, I myself, uh, I'm, I concentrate on writing. I myself don't go out to look for translators as well. Mm, so uh, I wish more will be translated. Um, at the moment, uh, is being translated into German, but again, no English, so, Thank okay. You. There's a few questions about your next project, asking what's your next book, and another related question uh, that they had heard that you were working on a history project of the city of Taipei, and I'm curious how that project has evolved over the years. Mm. My future project is always a secret. You will always know when it's kind of mature. Otherwise you wouldn't know, I wouldn't tell you. Right. But now I'm living in Dulan, in Taitung, by the Pacific, uh, with my 12 chickens and three cats and two dogs, and the, the gods in the mountains behind my house. And I go snorkeling every week. I do a stand-up paddle. So I and and I'm with the 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 native uh, people who are doing embroidering. I do a lot of farming. Uh, and yesterday I had to wear my high boots and cover up come from head to toe, afraid of uh, to avoid uh, attack of the 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 hornets. And so this kind of life definitely is going to seep into my next writing, I guess. But what is going to be, uh, I can't tell yet. Thank you. This is from Hoi Lam Ho. Uh, dear Professor Long, throughout your life, you've written so many masterpieces that have influenced so many people. Does your state of mind or attitude towards writing and the writing environment 
ever turn or change? And if so, what changes about that? Thank you so much. Attitude about writing. Um, yes, this is actually, Michael, this is actually a very profound question. You know why? Um, for example, today, can I, can you imagine me writing another wildfire? The answer is no. The time has changed. The circumstances have changed. The position of the intellectual, public intellectuals has changed. With the onset of the internet, uh, which kind of uh, takes away uh, the, the role of the gatekeeper in the society in all facets of life, um, when to speak, how to speak, um, has become a totally different game. So um, when I wrote Wildlife, one 800 word article would shape the whole society. Now everybody stop in the middle of their, whatever they were doing and listen. Nowadays, nobody, whoever writes anything, Habermas writes a thing. Who stops and listen? Because we are living in a sea of sound and fury and nobody is listening. So nowadays, I think our world is looking for a new way of uh, enlightenment, of seeing, of seeing and understanding, but definitely not the way before. And so for myself, my attitude about my role as a public intellectual, as a writer, it is something that's worth deliberating. I have to think with my age, how many years I have left. Do I will not, the most precious commodity for me is time. So I guard my time so jealously, I would decide on write only on things which I think is essential for me in this time and the and phase of my life. So the attitude about writing, well, it turns out to be a very, very crucial question, not only for me, but for, I think, for thinking people uh, throughout the world. Thank you. Let's, uh, do we have time for a few more? Are you okay to accept a few more questions, Professor? I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So there's a couple of student questions, and I think it's important to get some of the student voices here. Um, I guess this is a doctoral student. I was born and raised in mainland China, I came to Ireland for my PhD this July and began to breathe the fresh air. Liberalism seems to be a big concept. If I also wanna to start to understand this big concept and trace its roots, maybe I could have my own understanding about it, but I'm puzzled, where do I start? Do you have a starting point? Because you, I think you shared that you went through a similar journey when you were a student. Um. About liberalism. Yeah, and I guess this is someone who spent his life in mainland China is now in Ireland for the first time and is trying to acclimate to, I guess, the, yeah. this new world. Um, you know, I left Taiwan in 1975. And I, first I was a student at Bowling Green University in Ohio. And uh, the first snowfall, the first snow I have ever seen in my life. I was in the library. I came across uh, a small book on 19, about 1927 in Shanghai. Uh, and that was the time when the Kuomintang was purging the communists in China. And that was the first time I learned about the communist killing of the communist, uh, the, the KMT killing of the communist writers and so on. Uh, I remember that day, I so cold out. My, my, my world has changed that moment. I realized all what I had learned before was a big lie. Um, a couple, 10 years later, I wrote Ye Huo Ji started from that snowy night. 
I wanted to write something against the lies that I had received when I was a young student. And I did, I wanted that my next generation of young students will not live in lies. So now you left the China mainland, now, now you are in the West. I would say, just keep your eyes open, keep your mind open, uh, just learn new things. The West has its own problems, but it's a different level of problems, different fabric of problems. So learning is itself is a long process. As long as you keep your mind open, then you can go step by step and you learn about what you want to see. Thank you. This is another student question. It's kind of open, so you can interpret it as you like. As a 20 year old student in Asia, we still face the challenge of the unknown. How should we embrace the unknown, look into its future and make better decisions? And you can do whatever you like. Uh, <laughs> my dear, um, through, I think throughout human history, no matter what age and time, when you are 20, you, are, you always feel lost. When I was 20, I didn't know better. I didn't know the future. I couldn't see what's ahead of me. So um, I guess you simply have to have a sense of uh, try it and letting go. So be daring, try. And if you lose, you lose. Especially before you reach 30 or 35, you can afford making wrong decisions, going the wrong direction, which is perfect. Fine. And if a person in his life, his or her lifetime, has a quota of making mistakes, then you better make sure you make all the mistakes before you're 35. Good for you. Just go ahead. Thank you. The next question is from Professor Charles Laughlin from University of Virginia. He said he's studying the repertoire or reported literature, Baogao文学, from Taiwan, such as Renjian Magazine, and he's wondering whether literary nonfiction plays a more important role in a repressive society, uh, or also has a role in a more liberalized society like contemporary Taiwan. Um. Yes. Uh, I. I know what you mean. Um. If to judge from past experiences, yes, Bao Wenxue uh, played a very important role when uh, there's censorship on the news media. So that, that's the outlet where you find more truth. But when the society opens up and you, know, you have so much information about anything at all, then Baodao Wenxue's position and importance goes down. Um, and, and that's what happened in both China, in China and in Taiwan as well. However, um, is it only lim limited in to Baodao Wenxue? I'm not quite sure because I remember, uh, you know, uh, Philip Roth has in 18, 1989, when the uh, when after the Berlin Wall fell, he was telling his uh, writer of friends in the Eastern Bloc in Poland for Hungary, especially in Hungary, he was warning them. He said, "Now, now you are not oppressed anymore. Um, just expect that nobody's going to read your works anymore." So, and and in East Germany. Um, before the 1989, you would see uh, East German citizens sitting in the uh, U-Bahn reading novels, you know, a thousand words, I mean, a thousand pages. But after you are free, that phenomenon disappeared. So what I'm saying is, that Baodao Wenxue, in a free society, the importance of it going down, uh, it's probably not only limited to Baodao Wenxue, it probably applies to literature as a whole because people find different outlets of uh, being inspired or being enlightened. Now, I, I, I hope I answered the question somewhat. 
Thank you. Now, there's so many really wonderful questions. So I'm going to try mm -hmm. to get through as uh, maybe four or five more kind of shorter mm -hmm. questions. And mm -hmm. um, Michael, are we also going to do, to do the Chinese ones as well? You know, the vast majority of the questions are in English. There's only a couple oh, okay. in Chinese. So since the whole form, maybe we'll just stick with English since All right. uh, that mm -hmm. seems to be the dominant okay. language. So one is your, what is your hope or wish for PRC Taiwan relations? <laughs> Where do you hope things go? If, if you have read Da Jiang Da Han, then you will know my answer. Um, my highest goal is peace, that there will be, there will be no war. I think um, China should learn that war does not solve anything. It gives you stomach ache if you take Taiwan by force. And it will be a stomach ache that does not go away. And we Taiwanese, I think we have tried our damnest hardest to avoid war. There is too much talk of uh, Taiwan version of nationalism. Uh, which I'm very worried about. Uh, we have seen so many isms in the past and for more than 70 years without any real conflict, without any war experiences and the memory span is so short that we tend to forget how absolutely cruel and devastating war is. So what I wish for uh, Taiwan and China, I nowadays, uh, you have you see that fighter planes coming every day to Taiwan and from Taiwan, you see in the news media, all the talks about preparing for war. I am thinking back uh, to uh, 1914 to 1915, when the French intellectuals like Roman Roland and German intellectuals, how they got together and talk about peace. Why is it not happening here? Where's the voice of the Taiwanese intellectuals and Chinese intellectuals at this moment when everybody think something is going to explode? Where are the intellectuals from both sides of the state standing up and saying, no, there must be another way. That is what I'm thinking about. This is a question from Candice. She asks, what's your one key advice to young people in Hong Kong who feel so powerless right now about what's happening? I know. Um, I lived in Hong Kong for nine years. So what happened in recent years for me personally is heartbreaking. Um, but now you are there and you are young. I wanna say is maybe you could have a longer perspective. Um, use the time you have now try to enrich your own mind, learn as much as you can, um, prepare yourself for your future, read a lot, uh, let yourself be educated, and so that someday when a window opens, when a ladder appears, when the bridge suddenly appears, you are ready to create a new life. We have a, a few questions from Gloria and they're short, but I, I like Gloria Wu's questions. And so one of them is about writer's block. You, you're so prolific, maybe you don't have writer's block, but I imagine it's something you must have encountered over the years, but how do you overcome that? I, I'm having a writer's block right now. <laughs> Um, I moved here 10 years, 10 months ago, and uh, uh, my last book, Da Wu Shanxia, was published uh, in July 2020. That's only a year ago. Okay, 
And so um, as, a, as a nerd writer, I thought, huh, my next book should, should be out in July, 2022. Meaning, uh, I get up, since I moved here, I become a farmer and I, get, I wake up at five o'clock, I walk into, I, I walk into my garden, I work as a garden for three hours. I didn't want to go back to my study room. And in the afternoon, I should be working. I thought, no, I go snorkeling today. Uh, uh, and then when it's sunny, I said, oh, it's so sunny. I have to go into the mountain. When it's raining, I thought, oh, I have to play with the cats. I'm having my writer's block right now. And um, so what do I do with the writer? Mm, it will be over. It's like a dark tunnel. Um, is a matter of time. Gloria is also asking, what's the single book that influenced you the most in your life? Uh, the single book? Mm. Zhuangzi. And she has a third question. Hmm. What is your definition of xingfu, happiness? What does that mean to you? Um, that's when you feel you are loved. Thank you. And maybe we'll close out with a question from Candy Ho. And she writes, I'm a young adult, 25, who read your book, Mu Song, when I was 15, and have almost all of your work in my cherished collection of books, Wildfire, uh, the Big River, Big Sea, Dao Mountain. My question is, what would you encourage us young non-writers to do after reading your books? Aside from learning and thinking, what else can we do in our daily lives to spread your ideas in our generation and maybe to the next generation? And I think this is an important question. What do we do with books? What do we do with literature? Yes. What's the intention? What do we, what's our takeaway? I and mean, maybe that's also a nice way to end our discussion. What is Indeed, the indeed, what a good question. I think literature, makes you see what without literature you would not see in this world. And when you, through my writing or literature, get the capacity to see, see meaning seeing through as well, then when you walk down a mountain path, you see the beauty in the leaves, in the trees, in the birds, in the stone. When you are living your um, uh, very um, urbane, banal daily life, and you have the capacity to see, then you can see the people next to you, you can see what they are going to be 20 years from now, because you have the capacity to see. And you can see through time, you can see through space. If your mother is only 50 today, with your capacity to see, you can see her when she is 95. Once you can see her as 95, then you know how you behave, how you should behave towards. With literature, you get the capacity to see, and the capacity to see tells you how to position yourself vis-a-vis -vis nature, vis-a-vis -vis the society, vis-a-vis -vis your boss in a workplace, especially vis-a-vis -vis the family around you. And that's literature. Thank you so much for that answer, but also for sharing so many insights and wisdom over the last uh, 90 minutes. And I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot. We didn't get all to all the questions, uh, but I'm thankful for all of you who have participated and were engaged, thanks to Taiwan Academy, which I believe was one of the 
results of your period of time as minister. Yes, Paul. I started so, it. Yeah. Yeah. So they're one of our sponsors. So it's a nice, beautiful circle we're completing here. And um, and if you want to tune into future events from the Center of Chinese uh, Studies at UCLA, please visit our website. You can sign up for our mailing list and get information on upcoming events. And thanks again to everyone and especially to the wonderful, brilliant Longing Tai we, we We thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And I thank all my re readers when I'm uh, experiencing a writer's block. Well, say hello to me so that I write the next book for you. Thank you, Michael. It was Thank a pleasure. You.